Good evening. Once again, I'm Stephanie Rahul. We begin this evening's broadcast with President Biden's stark warning of the clear and present danger to American democracy. The president sounded the alarm during a speech in Arizona about what he described as the threat from MAGA extremists. And he did not hold back today, launching a direct attack on the former president and his entire party. There's an extremist movement that does not share the basic beliefs in our democracy. The MAGA movement. There's no question that today's Republican Party is driven and intimidated by MAGA Republican extremists. They're not hiding their attacks. They're openly promoting them. Extremists in Congress more determined to shut down the government, to burn the place down. Trump says the Constitution gave him, quote, the right to do whatever he wants as president, end of quote. I've never heard a president say that in jest. The MAGA extremists across the country have made it clear where they stand. So the challenge for the rest of America, for the majority of Americans, is to make clear where we stand, which is why I'm asking you that regardless of whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or Independent, put the preservation of our democracy before everything else. Put our country first. President Biden also spoke about Donald Trump's threatening post, suggesting that outgoing Joint Chiefs of Staff Chair General Mark Milley be executed. And then the president called out Republicans for failing to condemn it. This is the United States of America. And although I don't believe even a majority of Republicans think that, the silence is deafening. Hardly any Republican called out such heinous statements. General Milley responded to Trump's threat in an interview with 60 Minutes earlier this week. He is suggesting that you be punished by death, the former commander in chief to his former top military advisor. Um, look, I'm, I'm a soldier. Uh, I've been faithful and loyal to the Constitution of the United States for 44 and a half years. Uh, and my family and I have sacrificed greatly for this country. As much as these comments are directed at me, it's also directed at the institution of the military. Um, and there's, there's 2.1 million of us in uniform. And, and the American people can take it to the bank that all of us, every single one of us, from private to general, were loyal to that Constitution and will never turn our back on it no matter what. It almost seems odd to ask this question because the former commander in chief seems to be calling for your execution. Are you worried about your safety? I've got adequate safety precautions. I, I wish those comments had not been made, but they were, and we'll take appropriate measures to ensure my safety and the safety of my family. President Biden's blunt warning about the threat to democracy came as House Republicans held their first, first impeachment inquiry hearing into him. Our own Ryan Nobles has more from Capitol Hill. House Republicans kicked off their first impeachment inquiry hearing, Democrats posting a shutdown clock and arguing Republicans have yet to provide evidence President Biden directly benefited from his son's lucrative foreign business dealings. If the Republicans had a smoking gun or even a dripping water pistol, they would be presenting it today, but they've got nothing on Joe Biden. Republicans countering they've collected evidence that is worth further exploring. Whether it was lunches, phone calls, White House meetings, or official foreign trips, Hunter Biden cashed in by arranging access to Joe Biden. A GOP witness supporting an inquiry, but Democrats asking if he would vote to impeach now. He would vote no, correct? On this evidence, certainly. Before today's hearing, we pressed a top Republican about a WhatsApp message they say Hunter sent while his father was not in office, describing the Biden brand as his family's only asset. How does that demonstrate that there's some sort of political influence being put over him if at that time he is not a political, he's not an elected official? I'm definitely not going to pinpoint one item. I think we've outlined... You presented it. You're, it was your first thing that you brought up. So apparently you don't agree with it. So it's not that I don't agree with it. I'm asking you to explain it. I'll take the next question. The last thing before we go tonight is super awesome. The sphere is here. Well, it's almost here. The new entertainment destination officially opens in Vegas tomorrow night, and it is making a great big promise to change the entertainment world. Well, my very lucky colleague, Gotti Schwartz, got an inside look, and it is absolutely epic. Watch this. Right off the Vegas Strip is the future of entertainment in a way only science fiction could predict. 
Some calling it eye-catching. To others, it's out of this world. And when words fail, there's always an emoji. But this 366-foot shimmering exosphere is just the beginning because what's inside there is even more mind-blowing. What is your name? My name's Gotti. And I'm Jim. Gotti We've and met Jim. Before. Welcome to Sphere. What just beyond five say? Aura robots oh, is a taste of the most baffling sound system in the world. You're isolating I'm, I'm, each instrument. I'm isolating into each instrument into a beam. All of this starting with a simple sketch from Jim Dole, owner of some of the most storied venues on Earth, who decided to reimagine entertainment with a $2.3 billion gamble in the desert. What was your reaction when you saw it turn on? Well, I was enchanted, too. I, I mean, it was awesome. We designed it, we, we, we visualized it, and it's so big. And finally, inside the sphere within a sphere, 168,000 square feet of high-definition LEDs, 167,000 speakers, 17,000 seats, and 10,000 of them powered by haptics. It's impossible to describe, right? It's like trying to explain what a peanut butter and jelly sandwich tastes like to somebody who's never tasted one. This weekend, U2 claiming the first residency, followed closely by another fully immersive experience called Postcards from Earth, all about this even bigger sphere that we all call home. And not that they need one, but if you two decides that they want an opening act, maybe Secretary of State Anthony Blinken can do it. The sphere and the sweet sounds of Secretary Blinken to take us off the air tonight. 11. That is how many people were behind the majority of book challenges in the last school year. That's according to a breakdown put together by the Washington Post, which also found, surprise, surprise, that most of those objections centered on titles by or about people of color and the LGBTQ community. And all of this comes as Banned Books Weeks, Banned Books Week begins on Sunday. And I'm honored to welcome an author who knows a whole lot about controversial books. Leslie Newman, her latest is out this week. It is called Always Matt, a tribute to Matthew Shepard. We're going to talk about your book in a minute, but I want to start with a children's book you wrote nearly 35 years ago. Heather Has Two Mommies. It was ranked the ninth most banned book in the 90s. And now here we have this coming, book banning with a vengeance. Compare to us what it was like back in the 90s and today. I love that book banning with a vengeance. That is exactly what is going on right now. So, you know, back in the day, what happened is some parent would get upset and they would talk to the principal of the school and it wouldn't be like this big blown up thing with school boards being hijacked and people taking hundreds of books out of the library and not returning them and just all kinds of crazy things that are happening now that are really disturbing. Why do you think it's happening now, right? In theory, uh, as we move on, things are progressing, but they're not. They're worse. They're much Why? worse. You know, if I knew the answer to that, <laughs> um, I think that the previous administration unleashed an enormous amount of hatred and that has just carried over till today. I really do think that's what's going on. I want to talk about these 11 people, because that's what was the most surprising to me. Just 11 people are kind of in charge of the majority of this book banning. And I, I'm careful what I say, because in some ways they might actually have good intentions. But that is clearly getting warped in, in, a, in a terrible way. And things aren't going well, right? Is there a middle ground to be found? Well, you know, there's a certain road that's paved with good intentions, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I understand people wanting to, quote unquote, protect their children, but what are they protecting them from? You know, freedom to read is such an integral part of this country and of democracy. To, to see that being threatened is very frightening and very dangerous. How is it that it's just this tiny group of people having this massive influence over schools, libraries, books all around the country? How did this happen? 
So, you know, I'm, I'm really puzzled by this, and I'm not sure it's actually 100% accurate because there are people banning books or challenging books, you know, statewide, like in Texas, in Florida, the governor of Florida. So I'm not sure it's just these 11 people. I think it's a lot more than that. Well, certainly become that. I want to talk about this book. We're embarking on the 25-year anniversary of Matthew Shepard being brutally killed because he was gay. Talk to us about your connection to him, why you wrote this book, and why now. So I was keynote speaker for Gay Awareness Week in 1998 at the University of Wyoming, and Matt was on the committee that decided to bring me to his school to talk about my book, Heather Has Two Mommies. Which Did you get to know him? No, because I arrived on campus the day he died. So I got to know his friends. Um, and when I gave my talk, because I still wanted Gay Awareness Week to go on, all the LGBTQ kids sat in the front row and they left an empty seat. And I kept looking at that seat. So I feel this connection and I feel a responsibility and obligation an honor and a privilege to use my voice to amplify Matt's story because he's not here to do that. His mother fears that this country is starting over when it comes to LGBTQ rights. Do you agree with that? Starting over in starting a bad way. In a bad way. Yeah. Well, you know, Judy and Dennis, who are such incredible people, I mean, who else would two months after their son was murdered so brutally create the Matthew Shepard Foundation so that others would not have this fate. She never thought that the foundation would need to be in existence for 25 years. She thought a couple of years, things would move in the right direction, and that would be it. But obviously, that's not what's happening. Well, if the road to hell is paved with good intention, how do we take this road that we are on right now, if we are starting over, if the attacks are only increasing, how do we find the right path? Another good question. I think that it's just really important to understand that you have the right, whoever you are, to decide what your children are going to read, how you're going to raise your children, but you don't have the right to tell everybody what they can and can't read. And that is what has to be understood. And the only way it's going to be understood is if you keep writing and we keep reading and learning from you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, so Stephanie. Much. 